Come on, girlies. Pedigree sheep with a pedigree shepherd. For Giles Crust, it's all in the blood. And one day, he won the blue rosette. Crust, the family name, originally came from Crouet. It's a French name, and the family originally came from France with the Normans. This is the um, family tree of the Crust family. Uh, it goes back up to 1695. Margaret Thatcher's great-grandmother was a crust. She was related to my great-great-grandfather. Then when John Major took power, they did his family tree, and they found that there was a common link through the crust family. It's funny to think that, you know, the, the two distinguishing people in the family, uh, they both turned out to be prime ministers. A long-lost relative has come to stay, Prime Minister. There aren't many people who can trace their ancestry back for 700 years, let alone make a connection with two living Prime Ministers. But the Crusts share a common obsession, an obsession with descent. Well, as a geneticist, I share that interest in kinship and in ancestry. 30 years ago, I began working on the genetics of snails. I collected one of my first samples here on the Gower Peninsula in South Wales. 300,000 snails later, I'm back. Now, I'm one of the world's top six snail geneticists, and the other five all agree. Well, these snails are all genetically different. They're all really pretty things. Uh, this is my favourite one. I guess I knew his great, 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 great grandfather last time I was here. And the way I can tell that is because this snail has got the same genes as a snail who lived here in the early 60s. The snails haven't changed much. They haven't evolved. And I can tell that because I can look at their genes. They don't hide anything. They tell you whether they've got genes for pink colour, for yellow colour, for one stripe, for five stripe, and so on. That means that this snail and all these snails are living fossils. They contain the genes of their ancestors. The same is true of us. You get your genes from your parents, and they got theirs from their parents, and so on, back into history. And your relatives share genes with you. That's what relatives are. That means we can use genes to work out patterns of relatedness, patterns of kinship, and we've done just that for these snails. Now we can work out human history from genes in a way that we simply couldn't have done 30 short years ago. Although I didn't know it at the time, this valley was also the last resting place of a human ancestor. In 1823, a human fossil, 24,000 years old, was found in a cave overlooking the sea. It was discovered by William Buckland, professor of geology at Oxford. He thought the bones were those of a female, and only 2,000 years old. He called her the Red Lady of Paviland. 2,000 years seemed to Buckland quite extraordinarily ancient, because he wasn't just a professor of geology, he was a theologian as well, and he had only one textbook, and that was the Bible. And the Bible told him that the world was 6,000 years old. So a 2,000-year-old human fitted in perfectly to his idea of human origins. Now, of course, we know that the Earth and humans themselves are much, much older than that. But the story of our ancestry that emerges from the genes has some extraordinary parallels with the story that comes from the Bible. The search for ancestors is, above all, a search for nobility. It's no surprise that all kinds of peoples all over the world have thought themselves to be descended from the most noble ancestors of all, the people of the Bible.
We bring you peace and blessing from Jerusalem. And may the Lord bless you from Jerusalem. And may you see your children's children all the days of your life. I'm driving, regardless of my personal safety, across the field of Armageddon. This is where, according to the Bible, when the world comes to an end, the dead will rise and the faithful will gather together. Armageddon was also a place of real history. It was the land of the tribes of Israel, the people of the Bible. This tunnel runs beneath a great city. It once dominated the plain. Its destruction, long ago, led to one of the greatest of all legends. These are the ruins of the city of Megiddo. In 721 BC, it was attacked by the Assyrians. Its inhabitants became exiles, and most were lost to history. The lost tribes of Israel were soon endowed with magical powers. All kinds of people, from Peru to China, have claimed to be their descendants. Now, those claims can be tested using genes. Modern Israel is a natural laboratory of human genetics. Three million people have returned here, all of whom have some claim to common ancestry. Israeli geneticists are beginning to trace their patterns of descent. And to do that, they can use genes. Either genes for working pieces of the DNA, like this one here, which is from uh, genes that make muscle, or bits of the DNA which, as far as we know, do nothing, they're junk. But whatever you use, you get the same message. You get segments of DNA cut up and arranged rather like bands on a snail shell. And every individual's bands tells you his or her patterns of relationship. And let's look at this little group here. They're actually very closely related. There's a father, a mother, and their children, and they share all those bands in common. What about these people over here? Well, they're not completely the same, but they've got some genes in common. And in fact, we know that actually they're relatives of that first group. They all come from the same little population. So we can draw in kind of a family tree. But if we look at these people over here, we can see that although the, some of the genes are the same, most of them are different. And in fact, this group is a group of individuals that comes from a totally different part of the great diaspora of world Jewry. So if they share an ancestor with that first group at all, he or she lives way back in history. People have looked for the lost tribes of Israel for more than 2,000 years, and they've never found them. But of one thing, I'm completely sure. Some of their genes are here. Everyone's heard of the Good Samaritan. His descendants live today on a remote mountaintop on Israel's West Bank. What's unique about the Samaritans is that they were never exiled. They alone remained in their native land after the fall of Megiddo. Behind me, on Mount Gerizim, the Samaritans believe, Abraham surveyed the promised land and Adam and Eve set up home. Today, the Samaritans are celebrating Passover for about the 3,000th time since their ancestors first came to this place. Passover is the high point of the Samaritans' year. 
It's a ritual that links them with their ancestors, the tribes of Israel. I am from the tribe of Menashe. Menashe was the son of Joseph. Joseph, the son of Jacob. Jacob, the, three, uh, the, the third father after Abraham and Isaac. Once, there were 300,000 Samaritans. After centuries of persecution, only 600 remain. They are, they say, the last to follow the true teachings of Abraham and of Moses. My name is priest Elazar Abdel Mu'in Sadaka Yitzhak Cohen. I am 147 generation from our own brother of Moses. When God created the world, he created Mount Gerizim at the Holy of Holies and the contract between uh, us and our religion. We believe in ourselves that we are true Israelites. The priests are the guardians of the Samaritan's past. The rules for becoming one are simple, unforgiving, and strongly genetical. All the family of the, of the priests must descend from a line of priests. My father is priest, but I must be priest. My son would be priest. Geneticists, too, are guardians of ancestry. Now, the Samaritan's genes are being used to test their legends. Since the Samaritans themselves are very proud on their ancestry, they keep records, mostly of the male descendancies. But it is difficult to speak in, on the Samaritan as one unit. In fact, there are five patri lineages. They go by the uh, male in the families. And there are differences in the genetic characteristics of each uh, lineage, because there is a strong tendency of marrying within, not only within the limits of the community, but within each lineage, if there is a mate available. There is a very strong preference for cousin marriage, and more than 84% of the communities are either first cousin or second cousin. So this means they are probably the most inbred group in the world. The Samaritans record descent from father to son for many generations. The Y chromosome, which men inherit from their fathers, is a biological record of male ancestry. There are particular markers which distinguish between different types of Y chromosome, and when we tested them in the Samaritans, each lineage was found to show a different Y chromosome or different markers on, which are very congruent with the records of their patrilineal descent for each lineage. The Samaritans certainly are descendants of a group who has been in this particular part of the world for many generations and may well be descendant of the population who was here 2,000 years ago. Passover reaches a climax when the sheep are slaughtered and roasted. The Samaritans' rituals, their records and their genes all come together on Mount Gerizim. They tell the same story, an unbroken link with the people of the Old Testament. The Samaritans are living fossils of belief and genes. But what about the others who claim descent from the tribes of Israel? For most, only their religion remains as a record of their ancestors. Okay, we're, well, we're actually running directly inland from the coast here across the coastal plain. This is always the area that armies used to come thundering down or... Like millions of other Jews, Weitel Weingarten has chosen to live in Israel. It's always been of great strategic importance. 
Weingarten is now a doctor. He works in a remarkable community that lives on an old British air base near Tel Aviv. They say they have stronger links to the past than any other group of Jews. But here we're coming up to Rosh Ein, which we see on our left, uh, which is um, a township almost exclusively populated by immigrants from the Yemen who came here about 40 years ago. And uh, they settled them here in a tent encampment, which they eventually developed into Rosh Ein today. This group came right at the beginning of the history of the state when there was a tremendous feeling of euphoria surrounding the idea of the ingathering of the exiles and the Yemenites were very warmly welcomed uh, not only as a large number of uh, Jews coming in returning uh, to Israel from exile but also because of their um, own feeling that they were authentic or even perhaps more authentic than many other Jewish groups because of their long history back in Yemen. The Yemen, a thousand miles from Israel, was one possible refuge for the lost tribes. Its Jews had kept their faith despite years of persecution. In 1949, the new state of Israel resolved to bring them home. About 20,000 of them were flown here quickly and secretly from the southern tip of Arabia in Operation Magic Carpet. For the Yemenites, Operation Magic Carpet marked the end of 3,000 years of exile from the land of Israel. The Yemenites are still devoutly religious Jews. Mordecai Yatari, who's the unofficial historian of Rosh Ain, is a passionate believer in his people's unbroken link with an ancient home in Israel. ישראל. <laughs> אם תקרא את התלמוד, את הגמרא, מה שנקרא, ותבדוק כל דבר, התנהגות, אורחות חיים, לבוש, לימוד, שירה, הכל בדיוק אצל התימנים. זה מאוד יפה, חמישה כרכים, פסח לחוד, סוכות לחוד, שבועות לחוד, ראש שנה לחוד, כיפור לחוד, מושלם, בלי שום, אפילו התפילה של חול המועד. שקל וחצי, שקל וחצי. Michael Weingarten set out to discover if the genes of the Yemenites match their legends. He looked at the biological records of descent, at blood groups, various proteins, and even at tiny changes in the DNA itself. All told the same story. In most areas of the world, the Jews are distant genetically from their non-Jewish neighbors, but to a certain degree similar to Jews in completely different areas of the world. Um, however, this doesn't apply or doesn't seem to apply to the Yemenites, where there's a considerable degree of similarity genetically between the Yemenite Jew and the Yemenite non-Jew. One possible explanation suggests that there was a tremendous degree of conversion to Judaism in the Yemen. New historical research backs up the story of the genes. In the 5th century AD, thousands of local people in the Yemen were converted to Judaism. This means that many of the ancestors of those who returned to Israel in 1948 had Arab blood. 
How did you choose to deliver your findings? Well, I presented these uh, in a, at a conference uh, in the United States, and I presented them in English because I was rather reticent to discuss this whole issue here in Israel um, or to make it too accessible to public debate uh, to the people I work with every day. And I do very much respect and appreciate these sensibilities that people have a great need to feel that uh, they are directly descended from their original Jewish ancestors and that in some way the idea that conversion has uh, intervened along the family tree is in some way uh, demeaning, devaluing. The Yemenites are Jews, of course, and they share many genes in common with all other Middle Eastern peoples. But genetics destroys their myth of a pure line of descent from the tribes of Israel. Genetics is about the mixing of ancestry through sex. And because of sex, genes do not trace a single line of descent from a noble ancestor. Genes show that every family tree has many branches and they can reach to unexpected places. 5,000 miles south of Israel is a people who hold a vital clue to what really happened to the genes of Abraham and to the fate of the lost tribes. In the heart of Africa is a lost city. It's called Great Zimbabwe. It's always been linked with the story of the 10 lost tribes. Every mysterious monument seems to demand a lost tribe who built it and moved on. These African walls were once thought to be made by the builders of Solomon's Temple in Jerusalem. Well, this is a second Solomon's Temple. It's a damn sight harder to get to than the one in Jerusalem. But there aren't any tourists, and I haven't seen any machine guns. So on balance, give me Africa any day. Well, here we are, the second Jerusalem. That vision of a noble past is so powerful that it's been adopted by an African tribe. They're called the Lemba. They say that they built Great Zimbabwe and that they must be a lost tribe of Israel. Our Lord, we are the grandchildren of Abraham, the tribe of Seremani and Mani. As I'm standing here, I belong to the lineage of Seremani, and Seremani are the descendants of Solomon. What are your people called today? Today, in, in Zimbabwe, they are called Baremba. In Mozambique, they are called Basena. They still stick to that old name. North of Zimbabwe, they are called Bangwen. In the south, they are called Balemba. Chief Mposi of Berengue is the latest in a long line of chiefs. 
Mr. Tiv Jones. Hello, Chief. Of course, I'm very pleased to meet you. Thank you for inviting us here. Fine, 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 sir. And what is the significance of this magnificent red robe you're wearing? And the, the, the robe over This is the uniform of a chief in Zimbabwe. Yeah. How long do you think the Lemba have lived in this in this area? Some centuries. Centuries. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. And do you have place yeah. names and so on? Which yes. For example, that mountain there is Mtuzukwe. Yeah. Yes. And that big one there is Dumgira Mpos. That's your name, isn't it, it's Chief Mposi? Yes. yes. The ancestors used to stay there. Where did the Lemba come from before they? They came, came from the Sena One and Sena Two. Uh -huh. But furthermore, they came from Israel. They, say. they came from Israel originally. Yes. So. Is that also? Yes. 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 Uh -huh. Let's go. Good. The Lemba live what they believe to be the life of ancient Israel. Even in remote villages, they follow a version of Hebrew ritual. These are the women cooking uh -huh. sadza uh -huh. for us to eat. Yes. They are happy to see the sadza made, uh -huh. so they will eat after that. That's why they are happy. Mm -hmm. What are there some foods which are, you don't eat? Some foods. It is the pig's meat, because the pig is very dirty. It eats everything that is very smelling, bad, with bad smelling. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Do you think that your belief that pig meat is not clean mm -hmm. came with your people from Israel? Very. Very much so. Very. Ah, uh -huh. Yes, that's the tradition we are following. Are there any other practices which the Lemba have which perhaps are similar to those which people have in Israel, which Jews have? Yes, we don't eat the meat that is cut by anybody, cutting hair. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. So you, your meat has to be kosher meat, has Yes. It? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And what else? Are there any other similarities? Similarities, yes. They also have a, what is known as circumcision. Uh -huh. Yes. And the so Lemba? Yes. And we are doing that. Could you tell us a little about the circumcision ritual? What happens is the circumcision. I cannot tell you because it's a great secret. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And you think that all these great traditions of the Lemba came with you over hundreds of years from Israel? Centuries, otherwise. Centuries, centuries. Yes, yes. Of course, circumcision and avoiding pork are not unique to Jews. But in South Africa, where thousands of Lemba now live, there's more convincing evidence for their claim to be a lost tribe. Like all exiles, the Lemba need a symbol of their ancient homeland. They're creating it on a South African hill. This is their Dome of the Rock, it's their holy mountain. And behind me, they're building the Great Synagogue. Its entrance will point to the north, towards the ruins of Great Zimbabwe, which was once their Temple of Zion, and beyond it, to Israel itself their spiritual and perhaps their ancestral home. <laughs> their leader is Professor Mativa, who was once head of the University of the North. He sees himself as the keeper of the Lemba's ancestral conscience and the guardian of their biblical roots. Your great grandfather Abraham never said that you should forget about this. He said that you should preserve all your cultures and all the rules that you were given. Our history starts from here back to Yemen. Yemen, Judea. From Yemen to Judea. That's where we originated. Whether you like it or not, we are telling you that. This 
place is the graveyard of our great leaders who are lying buried here. The graves are pointing up to the north because they are all going back to Jerusalem where they came from. Before the body is completely covered, we pour in water. This water symbolizes the sea which they crossed over when they came over to Africa. And therefore, their spirit and their souls must cross back. They are Jews. Professor Mativa is the only Lemba to have visited Israel itself. I felt I was actually at the right place. A certain electric current went through my own spine and my own nerves. And at that time I felt if I die here, I will not complain. So you felt you were visiting your ancestors? Then? Yes. It took a geneticist to solve the puzzle of the Lemba's origins. So how long have you now been studying the Lemba? Well, we've been coming up to Venderland for about 15 years. Uh -huh. I used to bring students up and train them in anthropological yeah. fieldwork methods. And Over many years, Trevor Jenkins has built up a close relationship with the Lemba. And now he's been able to use their genes to test their legend. To our uh, surprise, perhaps, but delight, we found that they were uh, quite different and distinct when compared with the other Bantu-speaking populations amongst whom they live, and their closest affinities would be with Jewish groups. Or, let's be a little more precise, uh, with uh, Jewish Islamic groups. Our first clue, I might say, came from looking at Ashkenazim Jews in South Africa. These are the Eastern European Jews, and the similarities were there. The genetic link with the Middle East was only on the Y chromosome, the one that men inherit from their fathers. The Lemba have the same kind of tie with the past as the Samaritan priests. Well, if we look at their genes other than those on the Y chromosome, we wouldn't suspect at all that they were anything but African. We are saying that their male origins can be traced back to Semitic people. When one looks at the genes on all the other chromosomes, we do not find any significant difference between the Lemba and the Bender amongst whom they live. But if we look at the Y chromosome, there is a very striking difference. There's a simple explanation as to how Middle Eastern genes got into the Lemba. Centuries ago, Arab traders from the Yemen traveled down the African coast. Many had children by the local women, and over the generations, their genes spread. That's the message of genetics. History is made in bed. Genes move across the world through sex and not within a wandering tribe of heroes. Science usually pours cold water on myths, but the genes show that the Lemba's legend is in some ways absolutely right. Their Y chromosome proves that they are as much grandsons of Abraham, living tombs of the patriarchs, as are other Jews. But they are Africans. They don't look like most Jews. That's because they have millions of other lines of descent. 10,000 miles away, in another hemisphere, there's another unlikely Zion, another people who believe that they're a lost tribe. The world's fastest growing religion is building a pedigree for the whole human race. Soon, the Lemba story will be everyone's story. More than 50 years ago, Joseph Smith, a farmer's son, founded a new faith, the Mormons. He announced that he'd discovered a new book of the Bible. Its message was that the Mormons themselves were lost tribes of Israel. The Book of Mormon, written to the Lamanites, who are a remnant of the house of Israel, and also to Jew and Gentile. Written by way of commandment and also by the spirit of prophecy and of revelation. 
written and sealed up, and hid up unto the Lord, that they might not be destroyed. Joseph Smith was murdered, and the Mormons fled west. Like the Israelites, they were looking for the promised land. They found it here in Utah. Enduring incredible hardships, the Mormons dragged their wagons over the Wasatch Mountains into the valley of a river they called the Jordan. The Benyons are Mormons. Their family comes originally from the same part of Wales as my own. They live simply, farming in a remote part of the state. We have received what is called a patriarchal blessing. There's Lee's. Uh, this is the documents. Uh, that big. Yeah. Uh, and it's, we believe it's by prophecy or by revelation that we're told uh, which of the tribes of Israel we descend from. Lee and I are both from Ephraim, who's the son of Joseph. And Mormon Church has what we call the Articles of Faith, and we believe in the literal gathering of Israel, and that Zion will be established on this, the American continent. And this, this is in, more than likely in Utah, you feel? No, this will probably happen in the Midwest. Uh, we are told it will be in Independence, Missouri. Uh -huh. uh, uh, Adam will be there, and uh, Jesus Christ appears, and, and there's sort of a coming together of the whole history of the human race with its uh, major players. Is there any indication as to when that might happen? In the last days. In the last days. <laughs> They're always very careful. Uh, yeah. We don't set dates. Yeah, sure. That's right. Okay. Mormons are the most enthusiastic genealogists in the world. The Benyons have a vast knowledge of their ancestors and of their living relatives. Every summer we go to a couple of family reunions and these stories were told and uh, there's just been extensive genealogy work and publication of family histories and tracing them all the way back into uh, 600 AD or so. The family is currently working on a new catalog of all descendants of John and Samuel Benyon and the numbers are looking to be over 40,000. And Leah, what about, what about your family? Three or four years ago, we went to a Lee family gathering, and the facility they acquired to have the event was a sports arena for the local college. <laughs> you know, they have the basketball games, and it was pretty full. So there are thousands of <laughs> There are thousands of them. It's, you know, it's based in the uh, religion that we believe, that the ten tribes really were scattered throughout the world, and that you can find the blood of Israel in all nations. Behind me is Granite Mountain. It's one of the world's holiest places, and like many holy places, it's hard for an unbeliever to get to. I'm certainly allowed no closer to it than I am now. Hidden deep inside the mountain is a series of caverns. They contain relics, not of saints, but of ordinary people. They're safely stored behind atom bomb-proof doors, and the entrance is hundreds of feet above any conceivable flood. It's sometimes called the Mountain of Names. There's a good reason for that. Since man first appeared on Earth, there have been about 7,000 million people alive. And the names of 2,000 million of those are inside that mountain. That's the names of about one person in three since the beginning of our own species. At the end of time, the second coming of Jesus Christ, there'll be a giant cataclysm, and everybody will be gathered together for the last judgment. To Americans, there's always been a baffling gap in the Bible. None of it happens in the United States. The Mormons have solved the problem by building their own Zion in Salt Lake City. 
In the temple, the Grateful Dead are baptized, like it or not, into the Mormon church by what's called a proxy ordinance. I'm glad you're here today. For a few minutes, a living Mormon takes on a dead man's name and enrolls him into the faith. That's the whole point of Granite Mountain. This is Joseph Smith. He was actually the first prophet of the church. And he was the one that translated the writings of the ancient prophets. And he was actually revealed them by Moroni, who came as a resurrected being, and told Joseph Smith where the records were so that we could have that today. Do I believe that? Yes. Definitely I do. I do believe it. and. The reason why I believe it is because I've been able to read the book myself and be able to pray about it. And from praying about those things and, and reading it, the Holy Ghost or the Spirit has told me that these things are true. Mormons have a duty to increase the size of the church, and they tend to have huge families. Such enthusiasm has made them into the human equivalent of fruit flies. The geneticists, they're a godsend. So what's so valuable about the Mormon population out there? Well, their large family sizes are extremely valuable. Really, uh, Utah is, is a gold mine for the geneticists. It's, it's the geneticist's dream. What makes you so confident that the pedigrees are telling you the truth about the genes? Well, we can look directly at the genes. In the laboratory, we can look at bits of DNA represented here. So each of these lanes represents DNA from one of these individuals. We can test then that this individual did indeed pass a gene onto this individual. This individual passed a gene onto this individual. In that way, we can see that the history shown here corresponds to the genetic pattern that we actually see in the laboratory. Genes are making links that even Mormons have not uncovered. The Benyons found out that they had a history of inherited disease. Their family was riddled with colon cancer passed from one of the early settlers. Genes join Mormon families together into a hidden web of kinship. We had individuals in this family, individuals in another family, individuals in another family, all with the same disease. Using the genealogical database, we were able to find a common ancestor for all of those individuals to whom we could trace a diseased gene. So you've actually found the progenitor somebody who lived maybe 150 years ago. Yes, we, we, can, we can make that assumption. Usually we don't have the clinical data uh, for someone living 150 years ago. But if we see that that individual is the ancestor in common for a whole series of people who now have the disease, we have a very strong inference that that is indeed the individual who introduced the mutation into the population, say, 150 years ago. So genetics connects the living and the dead together in an ever-widening net. The further it's spread over living relatives, the further back in time we must go to find the ancestor shared by all of them. There's nowhere better to do that job than in the Mormon Family History Center. Anyone can come here and unravel the web of descent that connects them to the past. And it's amazing who turns up in the family tree. Well, I did a little bit of digging and I found that I was related to George Washington. He goes back, his uncle is my uh, great-grandfather with eight greats in front of it. And which, which particular king are you descended from? Uh, king Edward I, I think his nickname was Longchanks. One family line goes back to Adam. The rest of them are in the 1700s. And some of these ancestors have been able to trace back to the 700s. So you've got an ancestry line which is, what, 1,200 years long? That's correct. If you print out a wall chart, it would just cover a whole wall. Oh, and it's, it's, it's very large. You're at one end and Adam at the other. Right. right. I've spent the morning on the Mormon's computer system. In some ways, I've been on a special kind of internet, an internet to the dead. And I found an ancestor of mine, one William Morgan, who was born in 1814, about five miles away from where I was born, in Wales. 
But I found something much more surprising about him, that he was baptised. In fact, he was baptised a hundred years after he died here in Salt Lake City. And by doing that, the Mormons are passing a message to the dead, William Morgan included, saying that if they want to, they can join the church and be saved. But in fact, inside that huge genealogical index that the Mormons have got, there are millions of messages from the dead. Because that's what genes are, they're signals from people who died long ago. I myself contain about 1 64th, I think, of William Morgan's genes. This is my ancestral homeland, West Wales. Needless to say, there's a legend that the Welsh are a lost tribe. The Mormons are proud of the number of relatives they've discovered. They can find them because they have the records. They can trace themselves back to people who lived long ago, often to an ancestor shared by thousands of Mormons today. Well, I don't have the records, but I do have the genes, and I can use them to look for my own kin. And very soon, I could fill whales with people who are my relatives, and if I go far enough in the past looking for this common ancestor, the whole of Europe would turn out to be related to me. One big, happy family. And the genes show that that family, in the end, includes everyone. We're all much more related than we ever thought. The Crusts are fifth cousins to Margaret Thatcher and John Major, but so are 100,000 other people in Britain. Half the population is descended from William the Conqueror and almost everybody from the Emperor Nero. The further back you go, the more all-embracing the family becomes. There's a little bit of the Good Samaritan in all of us, and just about everyone in the world has some of the genes of Abraham. The genes show that we all belong to a lost tribe. Everyone descends from the people of Armageddon, from the city of Megiddo, destroyed 3,000 years ago. The genes tell me that I have a direct connection with almost any ancient figure I like to choose. But somehow, I'm still looking for someone special. There's one thing we can guess about the Red Lady, or the Red Man of Paviland, which was that he was pretty important. And there's one thing about important men in those days. They tended to have lots of children. They left lots of descendants. And I like to think that on the great river of genes that pass through history, that flow from the past into the present, through to the future, that perhaps he and I were on the same tributary the stream of genes that passed through him ended up in me. And next Monday at 8, Professor Steve Jones looks at genetic accidents and avoiding so-called bad genes in a potential partner.